Hello and welcome to lecture three. This lecture is going to discuss the Bitcoin economy. In this lecture, we will discuss the following. First, we're going to talk about the metrics of a currency. Whether you're trading in the yen, the yuan, the dollar, the pound, every single currency used on the planet that's considered to be legitimate has certain metrics that we can look at it from. For example, the distribution of the money. Is the money widely spread? and there's equal distribution amongst everyone, or is it hoarded by a small group of people? Uh, the supply and demand of the money, how much supply is there? Is there $200 million in circulation or $2 trillion in circulation? How much demand is there for it? How many people wish to acquire dollars because of trade? Uh, exchanges for the money. If you purchase, let's say, an Xbox from England, well, England prices things in the pound, and the United States prices things in the US dollar. And let's say you purchase this Xbox off of eBay and you're using PayPal to make your payment. Well, if this is the case, uh, you even though you've purchased an object in pounds, it's been priced for you automatically by the software in US dollars. And when you pay in US dollars, there are a series of millmans, international agreements, regulations, and such and such that actually handle all of those details of converting your US dollars into pounds so that the person in England will actually go ahead and receive pounds directly as if it was his next door neighbor handing him money. Uh, and you will receive your Xbox without any hardship or issue as long as, of course, he ships it. So exchanges for money are very important. We're going to discuss them. Relationship to other currencies is another important feature. Certain currencies tend to be deeply interrelated with each other. For example, the US dollar and the euro are incredibly closely connected, as are the US dollar and the uh, yuan and the US dollar and the yen. This is because of a variety of political and other factors. And oligarchalness is a term that I've used a lot to discuss, and it comes from the term oligarchy, which means rule from a few. Uh, oligarchy is generally when you have a small group of people who have a considerable influence over society. Uh, and there are many who would argue, for example, even in the United States, that there are a small group of power brokers, about 100 or 200,000 uh, personal, private, uh, and corporate entities, because of the amount of money they put into politics, are able to influence decisions. So this is kind of an indirect oligarchy, whereas you could have uh, other cases like a dictatorship where the oligarchy is very apparent. It's the henchman of the dictator and the dictator. So the term oligarchiness I tend to use to describe wow, to what level do small groups have an influence or control over a currency. So in terms of a high oligarchical currency, high oligarchicalness currency, uh, that would be the case where a small group of people can have a dramatic impact upon the money. In the United States, would be classified as that because we have this thing called the Federal Reserve System, which can tr affect the supply of the money and also uh, shoot for certain price points of the money. They can have dramatic impacts on the credibility, faith, and supply of the U.S. dollar. So a small group of people you've never seen met or dealt with can have a huge amount of impact on the money in your pocket. Whereas, for example, a currency backed in gold uh, with no central bank would be a low oligarchalness currency because regardless of people's attempts, no one entity is probably going to be able to significantly influence the supply of the money nor the demand of the money or its uh, value in terms of other currencies. That will be determined by just simple economics. And then we have Bitcoin-specific metrics. For example, mining pool hash rate, work distribution, uh, regulation, Bitcoin days destroyed, which is a metric we'll discuss in a bit, and the blockchain, which is another really wonderful pool of metrics that I'll go ahead and discuss in a bit. Okay, so let's begin with the distribution of money. There are four questions that we tend to ask when we're talking about the distribution of money. The first question we ask is, where is the money geographically based? And this kind of seems like an obvious question. We'd say, well, if it's the money of the United States, wouldn't it be based in the United States? And actually, it turns out there is more money outside of the United States than there is inside the United States. If you were to go to China, for example, and go to Beijing, you can actually purchase in many of the shops in Beijing items in the U.S. dollar. Even though it's not a legal tender, the Chinese merchants can accept the uh, U.S. dollar as uh, payment. 
So the geographical basis of the money kind of gives you an idea of the overall influence that country has, globally speaking. As the United States is the largest and most powerful economy in the world right now, uh, it has a tremendous amount of influence, and therefore its money is geographically very distributed. Um, the second question we tend to ask is, the money evenly distributed or controlled by a few? And this is a very misunderstood question. So I've included a graph here of the United States wealth distribution. If you take a look at the bottom 80%, they control 12.8% of the entire wealth of the United States, whereas the top 20% control 87.2%. So the top 1% control 35%, and this has been increasing over time. If the top 20% banded together and made a decision to pull all of their money out of the economy, put it into a cool wet sack in their basements, respectively, it would collapse the entire US economy. Nothing would get done. But because we have incredibly efficient financial markets, uh, this money actually ends up being distributed to the bottom 80% in terms of debt, loans through banks, um, venture capital for companies, uh, equity in companies. There are many ways that the top 20% can take their wealth and reinvest it for a return to the bottom 80% to keep the economy going. So this is really something that's deeply related with the efficiency and quality and regulation of the financial markets that allow the distribution of the money. Uh, so it's a very important metric. How does the money move through the economy? This is another very important uh, question about distribution. Generally speaking, if your money is moving very slowly, this is a signal of a recession and impediments to effective trade, meaning exchange is not happening well for some reason. Uh, and if your money is moving very quickly, very rapidly, this is an indication of a booming economy. And this is generally how economists tend to think of it. So therefore, they actually measure the movement of money through an economy and have developed many metrics to assess that, which are beyond the scope of this class. Um, how is new money added to the system? So in the case of the United States, it's done through a complex series of transactions involving the Federal Reserve System, Treasury bills, banks, and the US Treasury Department, amongst other factors and um, entities. Uh, and so this is a really important question because if you add new money to your system poorly, then you end up constructing a system that a small group of people can take advantage of and use this to the detriment of society. So it's, um, it's something we tend to think about, all central banks tend to think about and try to do in a way that doesn't harm particularly the bottom 80%. So it's usually done with interest and debt. So Bitcoin distribution. So how is Bitcoin geographically distributed? Well, it's geographically decentralized by design. The Bitcoin holds no flag. There's not an American flag on it. There's not a Japanese flag. It's a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer currency. There is no notion of a nation state or controlling interest. That said, it has significant penetration in developed markets, particularly the United States, Europe, Russia, and Japan. Over 85% of all the Bitcoins currently in circulation are contained within these entities. Over time, the hope is that the Bitcoin will become more and more decentralized. And the hope actually, the hope of the Bitcoin decentralization is that it will become more used in countries with weak, unstable currencies. You may recall from lecture one when we discussed the Zimbabwean financial crisis, had people in the country transferred the Zimbabwean money into Bitcoins, they would have actually wrote out that entire crisis without any issue whatsoever because the Bitcoin is independent from the economy of Zimbabwe. And if they could find a way to conduct commerce in the Bitcoin while that crisis was occurring, they would have no wealth destruction. They'd be completely fine and everything would be okay. Uh, so there's been a lot of movement to try to influence um, weaker nation states or weaker economies, the people of these weaker economies to go ahead and develop, uh, embrace the Bitcoin as uh, a pseudo national currency kind of a unique and intriguing concept. Okay, so or early adopters actually still control a large chunk of the Bitcoins in circulation. In fact, I've included a link here. This link is from the Bitcoin report, and it's listed in order of the from the smallest to the largest accounts. And because accounts are anonymous, we just have their public addresses. That's where you send the money to. We're not entirely sure uh, who this money belongs to. 
but all we know is that this particular account here has 447,785 bitcoins. Uh, and as you can see, the rest are fairly uh, populated as well. Um, this tells us that the early adopters of the Bitcoin still have a considerable amount of control and influence over the uh, Bitcoin money supply. And many have yet to sell because they think that the price of the Bitcoin is still too low. But as the price has gone up, we've seen some of the largest accounts actually uh, divest very quickly. Um, it's difficult to know the particular people who control the um, the bitcoins in the economy, and it's also difficult to know if these addresses are aggregated together into a larger whole. For example, the largest one that we know of is 447,000, but someone could control a million bitcoins, for example, and just simply have them in many, many, many small accounts. And this is a price we pay for the anonymity of addresses. Uh, maybe in the future, regulation will compel people to reveal their Bitcoin holdings. But as of right now, uh, no one is compelled to do so. We don't know who owns the Bitcoins. We just know that there are certain accounts that are highly aggregated, and they have been so for some time. So the assumption is that they're early adopters, people who started working on the Bitcoin back in 2009, 2010, 2011, when they were very cheap and uh, very accessible. Over time, the Bitcoins have become more distributed, particularly after the price hit $100 per Bitcoin. We started seeing more people for the first time entering the market, um, and we saw some of the older accounts, which had not moved their holdings for quite some time, actually liquidating for the first time ever. Uh, and this is very common with any asset. If you look at startups, for example, the CEO and the board of directors and so forth and all the interesting people who started with that company will probably have a significant equity share. But after an initial public offering, over time, the core group of early adopters will start selling off their holdings. And after 10, 25 years, uh, the largest shareholders tend to be mutual funds and other institutions, not the founders of the company, which is to be expected of the Bitcoin. Um, we typically measure Bitcoin movement with a metric called Bitcoin Days Destroyed. I have a very good way of explaining this, and I'm going to reserve it for a little bit later in the, in the um, lecture. And new Bitcoins are added to the Bitcoin economy by a process called Bitcoin mining. This is so incredibly important that I'm actually going to discuss Bitcoin mining in its own dedicated lecture, lecture four. So hold tight on that one. All right. So the next topic of money, of currencies, to help you understand what a currency is and the metrics upon which to understand its economy and value are supply and demand. The supply and demand of a currency are usually measured by a really complex series of signals divine from international trade and monetary exchanges, well beyond the scope of our course. You can get a PhD in economics and still not understand this topic very well. The people who do tend to make a lot of money either by uh, being professional traders in the Forex market or consultants for um, hedge funds or other institutions which financially benefit from the supply and demand, of, from understanding the supply and demand of money at a high level. You, you also can have a very rewarding career working for the Federal Reserve System if you understand this. So again, it's well beyond the notions of, of the scope of this course. But what we will say is, generally speaking, for any currency that is fiat-based, uh, there's usually a central authority that will decide how much money to put into circulation. And they do this based upon certain benchmarks. So they'll say, what do we want our interest rates in society to be? What do we want our employment levels in society to be? And they're either going to increase the money supply or contract the money supply to achieve these political factors.